Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Be in Luke chapter 1 today, verses 26 through 56. We're going to kind of break into one of the uh, songs that begin here. There's three of them that we're going to begin, and we're going to deal with the first one. Now, notice that we have already dealt with the birth of uh, John the Baptist, at least the pregnancy, not the birth, excuse me. Elizabeth is conceived. She's very old, and she's tickled to death, I want you to know. And her husband is, uh, can't speak because he didn't believe the angel in the temple. Now we're coming to Gabriel's announcement to Mary. It's a beautiful thing. Notice it says in verse 26, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. In the sixth month obviously refers to Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now the angel Gabriel. There are only two angels mentioned in all the Bible. One of them is Gabriel and one of them is Michael. Now Michael both appear in the book of Daniel. Michael seems to be the angel of the nation of Israel while Gabriel is the messenger angel of God. Now, the word Gabriel can either mean God is great or God's strong man. And usually the latter is what most scholars go with, but it depends on what Hebrew root that you take it from. It's very unusual to name angels in the Bible. Um, they just usually don't. They just say two angels or two men, but here they name them specifically. Now, Gabriel's mentioned previously in Daniel 8.16 and 9.21. Notice where it says, Sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. Nobody expected anything good to come out of Galilee. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 is a startling prophecy that Galilee, an area known for its mixture of Gentiles and Jews, is going to be the scene of the ministry of the Messiah. And here, the Messiah's mother is from that same area. Now, notice where it says, to a virgin, they're engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, this in... In the Gospel accounts, the Synoptic Gospels, the word virgin here cannot mean anything but a virgin, a woman who has never known a man. Now, in Isaiah 7.14, there's been much discussion here. In years past, many translations of the Bible were burned because they put young woman instead of virgin. Now, I want you to thank me for a minute. In Isaiah 7.14, the Hebrew word is alma. Now, that word can mean virgin, but really it means woman of marriageable age. I do not believe in two virgin births. I only believe in one. Now, there had to be a birth in Isaiah's days as a sign to the king. So I think the word is appropriate there that can be ambiguous to mean virgin or young woman because I think a young woman had a child in Isaiah's day. But here we have in the New Testament the uh, undoubted word that means virgin. Okay? Now, the word engaged is a perfect passive verbal form. Jewish engagement was a very binding legal social contract. Matter of fact, we have the unusual terms of a unmarried widow. <laughs> Doesn't that sound usual? Usually, Jewish girls got married between 12 and 13 with a year's engagement period. So Mary was about that age. She had been married for part of that, I mean, engaged part of that year to Joseph. But engagement was so binding, it was considered marriage. We see part of that in Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and following. Matter of fact, the only way to break an engagement was divorce, even though there had uh, not been any living together at all. So it was a very strong, binding thing. Now, the word Joseph means increasing in Hebrew. A descendant of David. And that is extremely important. And it's, it's important that it's Joseph and not just Mary. Now, we're not sure if Mary's lineage is also divinic. The genealogies of Matthew and Luke are different, and the theory has often been that one is the genealogy of Joseph and one is Mary, and they have different tribal uh, descendants. Of course, for Jews, to be legal, Jesus' lineage would come through Joseph, even though Joseph was not his daddy. Now, that sounds very strange to us, but to the Jews, it would be the only way that he could legitimately be uh, put in a tribe. So you ought to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7 where the lineage of David is so important, verses 12 through 16. Psalms 89 and uh, I think verse 32 in this very chapter will show you the, the significance of Joseph being of the line of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And so the angel came to her home and said, Congratulations, 
You highly favored woman, the Lord be with you. Now, the, uh, the New Catholic translation, the New Jerusalem Bible says, following the Vulgate, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace. That's a good translation as long as you realize she's receiving the grace, not giving the grace. I believe the New Testament it says there's one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the way Paul put it. I think Mary is a wonderful girl. I think she has great faith, and I think she is a great lady. But I do not believe she is an intermediary to God. I believe she has other children. Um, I believe she doubted. I believe she had sin in her life. You have to decide, but I hope you'll decide based on the content of the New Testament and not on the traditions of men who, for theological reasons, have done things to her, her background, and her life. Now, notice where it mentions, you highly favored. This is a perfect passive participle. She was highly favored in the past by God. Apparently, she was a very faithful Jewish girl. Isn't it just like something God would do that he took a peasant girl, 12 or 13 years old, and blessed her like this. I tell you what, just sounds like him, doesn't it? Now, in verse 29, uh, but she was agitated at what uh, he said. Well, I think I would be too. Can you imagine how surprised she must have been if the angel told you this? Uh, and begin to ponder what this greeting meant. Imperfect. She began to think over and over in her mind. Verse 30, and the angel said, stop being afraid. Now, this is the present imperative with the May article, which means stop and act already in process. She was afraid. You know what amazes me? If you'll get your concordance and look up all the times stop being afraid is mentioned in the Bible, that is the customary phrase when the supernatural world breaks into the physical world. Whether it's angels or God himself, in a, uh, the angel of the Lord or whatever. And friends, I, I want to tell you, I think uh, angels or the supernatural breaking into our world is a cause of great consternation for us. And it's always assumed with fear. And so that's a good word. Stop being afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Verse 31, listen, you will become pregnant and bear a son, and you must name him Jesus. Now, I, I want you to know this Jewish woman knew that she could be stoned to death for this. Deuteronomy 22, 24, and 25. Also, can you imagine a young girl, an angel saying that you're going to have a son, and it's going to be by God? You know, one of the reasons the Jews are so nervous about the virgin birth is that in the church sometimes we forget how Greek we are in the way we think. And you know, the Greek gods on Mount Olympus or the Roman gods, they run around having love affairs with human beings all the time. But friends, this is not a sexual thing. The Holy Spirit is not a male. He is a spirit. There was nothing of a male sex organ. There was nothing of sperm involved in this. This is a miracle of God that occurred in a woman's womb. It has nothing to do with sexuality. And to tell you the truth, it has nothing to do with chronology because Jesus has always existed. So we have a miracle of the eternal breaking into time. And that's basically what we have. Now, that's what it mentions then. And you must name him Jesus. Now, that goes back to Matthew 1.21 where the, Joseph is told what to name. The father's responsibility was to name him. Now, the word Jesus really is pronounced in Hebrew, Yeshua. And it's exactly the same as the Old Testament word, Joshua. Now, the Old Testament prophet named Hosea meant salvation. If you add the covenant name for God onto Hosea, Yeshua, you get Joshua. Yahweh saves, or Yahweh's salvation, or Yahweh is saving. Uh, there's many ways to put this together, providing a verb or making it a noun or whatever, but it's Yahweh saves. It's very close to what the name means. Now, notice in verse 32 when it says, And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now, the Son of God is a term that we need to think about. In the Old Testament, the plural, the benim Elohim, means the angels, the sons of God. And when it's plural in the Old Testament, it always means angels. When it's singular, it can mean several things. It can mean the nation of Israel, like in the book of Hosea. Or in 2 Samuel 7, it can mean the king. And that seems to be the ideal here, that Jesus is going to be the royal lineage of David and Son of God is a title for king. And I'm sure they understood it here before they understood the complete theological implications of the incarnation. Okay? Notice where it mentions them. The Lord God. Now, that, is, that reflects an Old Testament title. In the Old Testament, the word 
the Yahweh, from the Hebrew verb to be, Exodus 3.14, um, the Jews were afraid to pronounce that name lest they take God's name in vain. So whenever they, that name appeared in their scriptures, they would pronounce the Hebrew name for Lord, Adonai, or Adon. And so in the Old Testament, it sounds funny for English readers to have Adon Yahweh, which is over and over. So we usually put in the English Bible, Lord God, and this reflects that Old Testament English usage. He will give his throne to his forefather David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will have no end. Now, this is not a millennial thing we're talking about at all, some thousand years. This is eternal. This reminds me of Daniel 7:14. He came to set up an eternal kingdom, not a temporal, uh, chronologically limited kingdom. Notice in verse 34 when it says, But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no husband? She was asking, I think, a very logical question. What she was saying is, I don't understand how God's going to do this. And the angel just reassures her, God can do it. And I think she was thinking, there's going to be moral reproach on me. People are going to think evil of me. They're going to think bad of me. And that's true. They probably would. And so I think she was asking for, for a little more information. Look at verse 35. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and so your child. Now, I want to say to you, this, this literally fulfills two very important scriptures. In Genesis 3.15, it talked about that the serpent will bruise the head of the Messiah, but the Messiah will be born of woman. So Jesus was predicted to come from a woman, and that's what we're fulfilling. You might want to see 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The word overshadowed here, Exactly what it means, we don't know. It's the it's the special coming of the presence of God. I think it's related to the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament, where the cloud overshadowed Israel, symbolizing God's special, uh, kindly, providential presence and care. What's more than that? I don't know. Notice it says the child will be called holy. Now the word holy in the Bible means set apart for a particular task. God is holy in the sense of his transcendence, his otherness, his differentness. We take on that holiness when we're related to him. Now, in verse 36, uh, And listen, your relative Elizabeth has herself to become pregnant, although she is old. Sounds like Sarah, doesn't it? Genesis 18, 14. Except uh, Elizabeth didn't giggle so much as Sarah did. Um, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, which was a real sense of God not loving somebody for a Jewish family. For nothing is ever impossible with God. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Um, verse 38. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's slave. Uh, may what you say take place with me. And the angel left her. What a, what a courageous, faithful, trusting, young Jewish girl. Teenager. Oh, my. Now, in those days, Mary got up and hurried off to the hill country, to the town in Judea. Uh, and she went to Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped within her. Now, there's nothing usual about a baby six months jumping around. I remember with my kids, I used to really like to feel them kicking, you know, at that age. It got exciting about that time. There's nothing unusual about a baby kicking at that age. But friends, there's something supernatural about the timing. Now, you know, that's very characteristic of the Bible. God often uses natural events, but with supernatural timing. Think about the uh, um, harnets in the conquest. Think about the uh, crossing of the Jordan River, which is probably an earthen uh, well, wall fell upstream. Uh, think about many things that God has done. The timing has been the supernatural element, not the event itself. Uh, having a baby is not a supernatural event, but the fact there's no man, you see. Now, there's a miracle apart from the natural, but quite often God uses the natural with a supernatural timing. And that leaping is this. I get so tickled with uh, Martin Luther here. Martin Luther says... Well, if the baby can leap at the presence of Messiah, why can't he be baptized as soon as he gets here? And Martin Luther uses this for a proof text on infant baptism. The Jews, by the way, said that prenatally infants could respond to spiritual things. Uh, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to know this is pre-Pentecostal. You mean Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost? Well, that's the, that's the setting. And her words are going to reflect a supernatural understanding of who this child will be. And here's her tremendous uh, prayer and song and greeting to Elizabeth. Blessed are you among women. That's a Hebrew idiom of superlative blessing. Blessed is your child. 
Why is this privilege mine to have the mother of my Lord come to me? Now, that seems to reflect Psalms 110.1, which seems to say, though this child is going to be special and holy, it is not the Father. I do not believe in modalism. I believe in a trinity, three and one, not three successive stages. Heaven was not empty when Jesus was on the earth. Now, verse 44. As soon as your greeting reached my ears, my baby leaped for joy within me. Blessed is she who has believed, for what is promised to her by the Lord will be completed or fulfilled. Uh, now, of course, this who has believed, um, Mary took God at his word. Abraham took God at his word. That's the essence of belief, is trusting the trustworthiness of God when he speaks. Now, in verse 46, in Latin, this is called the Magnificent. It's very similar to Hannah's uh, praise to God in 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. Then Mary said, My soul extols the Lord and my spirit exults. Now, the word soul and spirit are in a parallel relation here, which means soul and spirit are synonymous. Very hard to lock down these Hebrew terms like nephesh and the Greek terms like suke uh, and pneuma. Uh, I, I want to say to you that I believe with my study of the Bible that man is a unity, not a dichotomy or a trichotomy. I believe man is body, soul, and spirit as he relates to part of his universe and his world, both spiritual and physical. But I think primarily we are a unity and something like the... the um, uh, I can't think of the word. When we, when we die disembodied, that's very unnatural. It won't be long for us. I've done a tape on that called Unity, Dichotomy, or Trichotomy. I'll make that available to you if you'll write to us. It's, a, it's an interesting discussion. Now, the word exol, extols and exults, the first is present, and the second one is aorist. And so I think they're linked together. Now, notice it says, My spirit exults in God my Savior. Uh, I think Mary realized she needs a Savior. There's going to be time in Mary's life when she's going to come get Jesus because she thinks he's crazy. Remember that? Now, I think Mary had some doubt. I think Mary had sin because I believe uh, Romans 3.23 applies to Mary as much as it applies to every other human being except Jesus Christ. The only sinless one is Jesus the Christ. Everyone else is in need of a Savior. And so Mary needs to receive grace and Mary needs a Savior. She can't give it. She needs it for herself. Now, for he has smiled upon his slave in her lowly station. Isn't that just like something God would do? She is in a lowly station. God does smile on her. Um, for the Almighty. Now, the Almighty, El Shaddai, is the patriarchal name of God. We learn from Exodus 3 that uh, all the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them knew God as El Shaddai. And only with Moses does the term Yahweh come uh, revealed. Okay? Um, holy is his name. And, of course, the name reflects his character. And I think here it's an emphasis on his transcendence, his otherness, his difference here, not primarily set apart for a task. And then it says, he shows his mercy from age to age. Some of the most beautiful passages are in Deuteronomy 5.10, Deuteronomy 7.9, where it says, he will visit the iniquity on the fathers to the third and fourth generation, but love and mercy, hesed, covenant love, to a thousand generations of those who love him. Ooh, what a God we have. Yes, the Bible says he is wrathful and we will pay for our sins, but the Bible says his love is the preponderance of who he is and overflows to all of us. Now, to those who fear him. Friends, I don't think the word fear is like a, a puppy to someone with a newspaper, but I think fear means reverence, awe, respect. I get goosebumps when someone says, well, the... The old man upstairs. I, tell you, I get scared. They call him the Dodger upstairs. Oh, my soul. We're talking about the creator of the universe. How can we speak to him like that? And there's a real paradox in the Christian faith. I know that Hebrews says, come boldly to his throne of grace. And in my mind, I picture myself getting up into God's lap as a child and loving him. That's meaningful to me. But friends, the same moment I feel like that through Jesus Christ, I can come right to his throne and call up in his lap. The same moment I am on my knees before him as the creator. There's a, there's a tension between reverential awe and familiarity. And both are there. And both are true. Some days I stand in amazement. Some days I need to cry on his shoulder. And I need both. Now, notice where it says in verse 51, He has done mighty deeds with his arm. Now, God does not have an arm. This is an anthropomorphic phrase. 
speaking about God as if he was a man, but knowing he's not a man. I've also done a tape on this anthropomorphism in the Bible about God. I've entitled it The Femininity of God. Now, that's an interesting thing about God language, and you might want to send for that. Now, when it says his mighty deed with his arm, this is a biblical way of talking about God's power in human history. God acts in our world. God has the potential power and desire to effect our daily lives as well as the destiny of nations. This is speaking about that God does act when his people pray for God's glory and purpose. Woo! Notice verse 51, the rest of that, through, uh, 53. He scatters those who are proud. He dethrones monarchs and he satisfies... Oh, excuse me. He dethrones monarchs. This to me is how God's standards are so different from man's standards. You all see Isaiah 55 around verse 8 and 9 and 10. His ways are so different. You see, I think real, true proclamation of God will do two things. It will make the comfortable uncomfortable, and it will make the uncomfortable comfortable. It will pull down the rich and powerful, and it will lift up the broken and weak. Isn't that just like something God would do? Now, and that's this whole thing. He exalts the poor. Uh, he um, satisfies the hungry. But he sent the rich away with empty hands. The Bible speaks of wealth as a deterrent to God. It doesn't condemn wealth. It condemns the love of wealth. But most wealthy people trust in their own resources. The early church primarily grew out of the poor, underprivileged social class. Today, the people that respond most readily are those who are in need, not those who have all they want. Now, in verse 40, 54, he has helped his servant Israel. Now, in verse 33, he's called Jacob. We're talking about the, the Jewish people here, okay? Uh, so as to remember mercy. And that word mercy means reflects the Hebrew covenant term, hesed. As he promised our forefathers, Abraham and his descendants forever. Now, this comes from Genesis 12 and 15. What a tremendous promise God made to Abraham there. And Abraham walked in that all of his days. He was a, he was a sinful man. He did some dumb things, but he walked in those promises of God. And this is the fruition or the culmination of those promises in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, Mary stayed about three months and then returned home. Returned home to ridicule. Returned home to social mockery. She'd be showing now some. And everybody would say, Aren't you Mary? It's about to be married to Joseph. Well, look at you, will you? I... Uh, I just want to say that the day you think God is in your box and you understand all that he is going to do, be careful. Because God's just liable to come to a Jewish peasant girl and say, I'm going to make you pregnant for my glory. Or he's just liable to come to an old woman who never had a child and say, I'm going to let you have a child for my glory. Or he's just liable to fulfill Old Testament promises that you forgot all about. Friends, God's not in our box. He's sovereign. He does what He wants to and amazes us with what He does. And I am so very glad. What a wonderful Jewish lady Mary is. I don't know how much she understood all that was happening, but boy, she lived up to the best light she had with great faith and joy. How I love that lady. But I don't worship her. I don't use her as a mediator. And I'm really not trying to pick on Roman Catholics because I have great respect for them. They've held to the Bible so well in many areas where others have not. But I just can't put anybody between me and God except Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus will listen to our prayers. Jesus cares about us. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He weeps over us. He longs for us to come to know Him. It doesn't say all who are laid, all who are heavy laden come unto Mary. It says, all who are heavy laden come unto me. And I'm not putting Mary down. I'm just saying there's one mediator. and It's Jesus Christ. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again same time, same place next week. God bless you.